so yeah, you can sort of conveniently nicely following on from what um was just talked about. Um so we've been doing some work at CH on object storage as well, is so mostly uh trying to find sensible ways of using this this new uh newish storage solution. Um given that in the future it's going to become more of more of a part of uh, of our workflows and and uh, analysis um as opposed to sort of traditional disk storage. Um so we've been trying to with sort of a if I got on the first slide, I was almost forgot. Oh yeah. Um this is a sort of formal objective and motivation, even though I would argue that my oh, or maybe even our objective main objective and motivation is just being, just being quite nice to geek out on this stuff and 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 mess around and see what we can actually do with it and, and try out all sorts of new tools. Um but the main idea being that um well as I've just mentioned that it, it's going to become more important as a as a as a uh, in in a lot of our compute workflows in, in the future, um, and it's it has many good points, but it's also quite difficult to use if you're new to it. Um, so a lot of our our work is the work that we've been doing. It's been it's been going into trying to find the best ways that people can um, uh, can get a data on there and make use of this of this storage um, and. And I sort of write the user guides and documentation that's, that that seems to be quite badly needed uh, at the moment, um, given the sort of plethora of tools and and different technologies and everything that surrounds it. It's not always clear what the best approach is for all these things. Um, I think I've kind of actually just covered half of that, but anyway, um, I'll go I'll go over it again briefly. Um, I wanted to sort of just a little slide, give a bit more information on on. on on what object storage is, I guess not, 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 not everybody knows. Um, um, the main difference, I guess, is that is in the name that files it, stuff is stored as objects, not not files. So files become less and less important. Um, and you're you're really looking at um, it's and, it, and and sort of in line with that, it's not hierarchical as traditional disk stuff. So you don't have folders and subfolders and and subfolders, which I think I've sort of hinted at on this one. Um, it's very, it's much more of a, of a flat structure, but uh, um, the file versus objects sort of um, uh, comparison is sort of takes a little bit used to, um, especially when you're sort of used to accessing data in, in lots of their CDF files, um, which in sort of doing and CEH we do quite a lot, and I know a lot of uh, climate and modeling work uses these sorts of formats, if not net CDF, then something similar. Um, um but if it's an object storage everything is done over in in objects so you 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 are pushing and pulling objects over http um and if therefore if you've got large files um that it doesn't work very well because then you'd be pushing and pulling large files to do potentially not much so potentially looking at only a little bit of that file but you might be pushing and pulling the entire file and it's uh, so these sorts of nuances that we're sort of trying to get our, get our, get our head around so um What's a good way of um, of using that the way object storage works with with the data that we're used to, um, and the, the, the approach that we're using at the moment, it, or, or messing around with the most, is, is converting it into a, as NetCDF files into ZAR into ZAR storage files or archives, um, which um, instead of being in lots of individual files, they sort of explicitly store the data in in, in chunks. Um, so which you can which other things you then can push and pull over over the object storage system. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of our work has been working out. We know sort of what we want to do with our data, um, but how do we actually get it up there, and what and what do we do with it? Um, what's that process like? Um, so we did a lot of quite a lot of work on this a couple of years ago. Was it a couple of years ago now? Um, where we were using lots and lots of different sort of a plethora of different tools, um, which did their job, but for different little bits of the, of the process chain, um, but um, altogether made the process very fiddly and obscure and not very not so easy for for new users, which is what we're, we're trying to sort of promote this the use of this at CEH. Um, um, so we the way we used to do it was to basically take our NetCDF files, uh, use a Python use Python X-Array library to read these in, um, use rechunk at all or kachunk to um, get these into the, the right chunking format, which Amelia will, uh, will talk about in a moment, um, and then use 
other libraries to actually push all this data up onto the object storage and then other libraries to access it. Um, which So it was all rather fiddly and complicated. Um, now that we sort of revisited it um, a few months ago and over the last few months, um, we find that slowly these tools are being consolidated um, um, into and starting to sort of abstract away a lot of the complexity behind it, which which is which is which I think is great. Um, so we've been focused on using um, the uh, Pangeo Forge and and their sort of their their recipes package, um, which in a few lines of code handles a lot of this a lot of the stuff um, in that workflow. You know, without you having to explicitly try and handle all these different tools and all their different configurations. Um, and um, the idea, I'm mean, currently sort of writing readmes and how tos and, and guys for actually using this uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, and I think from from there, I'll, I'll lead on to Amelia, who will talk about um, not so much. So I've been doing some more work on the conversion and the upload, but I think but Amelia will talk about the making uh, the, sort of the the chunking, which is a bit of a key aspect of of object storage and making the best best use of it. There you go. Um, hello everyone. Um, so today I'll be talking about a different aspect of the work that we were doing, which is basically looking at the chunking aspects. So um, this is the data set that we originally had. It's a hundred year data set with a 360 day calendar and um, it's over UK at one kilometer resolution. So the X and Y coordinates are 656 multiplied by 1057 grid points. So that's the whole data set we have, which is actually by climate study standard is a mid-range um, sized data set. It's actually not very large, but even with this, if we upload the whole thing onto object store, we will not be able to extract it obviously on a cloud network. It would not be possible. So we have to break it up um, into different uh, bit size, byte size pieces so that we can call each element for whatever, um, experiment or analysis that we are going to do. Um, so we tried six different types of chunks. Um, as you can see in the red shading, there are the types of chunks that we did. Um, we did monthly chunks. So basically the whole spatial domain for 30 days, uh, seasonal chunks for six, uh, uh, sorry, seasonal chunks for 90 days. And then we also did yearly chunks for 360 days. And then we did some spatial temporal chunking in which we looked at 10 by 10 uh, grid point spatially, but for the whole time period, um, the 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer for the 10 year and the 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer for just a year. So there are different types uh, of ways that we broke up the data set. And then we ran these through three different experiments. The experiments are basically, we tried to plot one grid point for the whole time series. The second one is we just plotted a area, uh, sorry, the whole area um, for a year's average data, as you see in the second graph. And the third one is we took like catchment averages. So an area average of a catchment and calculated the time per series. So these were the three different experiments we ran for the six chunks. You see seven chunks on my spider web plot because the seventh chunk is a net CDF chunk. So the net CDF chunk is basically the one on the top right. The net CDF one is a monthly chunk. Um, and that was how the original data set was chunked. And what we did with this was we ran all of these chunks and we looked at how long it takes them to run these three experiments if we were to do them. And we ran them multiple times to just get an average of um, different time periods. And in the spider web plot, the colors correspond to the different experiments. And we do note that uh, the one is uh, the one which has the least amount of time for all the experiments practically is the 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer yearly chunk, which suggests that we should do a mid-range sized chunk, and it should be preferably spatially as well as temporally chunked, because that would be the best way to get a, um, for any experiment or analysis that you may be doing. Uh, if you have a very specific use case, then you can pick uh, some specific chunk size that would be perfect for your analysis, because there are some times that some chunks perform better for certain analysis, but not always. So it's better to go for the mid-range spatial temporal chunk as expected. Ooh, that went wrong. Sorry for the weird thing that happened with the model thing. 
Um, but here we have a demonstration notebook. What we did was we took this data set and we created a notebook to read the data from object store to create just an annual average cycle of daily maximum temp air temperature. And we not only plotted the model data that I just discussed with you, but we also took observations that were available over UK, which are available freely through an API. So this notebook basically can work on any platform. It, it is platform agnostic. So you can run it on Jasmine. You can run it on something called Data Labs, which is again a Jasmine output, or you can run it on Google Colab. It works on any resource. So basically these things are very good for um, collaborating across partners, international teams. Not everyone can have Jasmine access and rightly so. So if you are collaborating with such people, Object Store can be made open for people to work on certain data sets and you can obviously limit read and write access accordingly. And this notebook, which does this analysis just takes about two minutes. And obviously the longer analysis that you do, it takes a longer time period. So accordingly, we are reworking on a GitHub repository for this to provide um, all of what Matt and I have talked in uh, open access GitHub repository. It's still in, I would say, in progress. So I would say, please watch this space. We will soon have it out for you guys. Um, so this brings me to the end of it. We have been able to demonstrate that this works. Object stores can be accessed by us or even our collaborators who may not have Jasmine access. And we have been able to see that we can make informed decisions about the file types or the chunk types. Um, we can access NetCDF files also from or ZAR files from Object Store, but it depends on use case. What is your exact use case? Um, and of course, the ease of, external ease of access is what is great about Jasmine Object Store. Finally, uh, the next steps are, of course, the GitHub repository. Um, we're also hoping to develop training modules if possible and would be happy to collaborate with anyone who is interested on working with these. And finally, this is a future thing that we want to do that can we do a uh, demonstrate a portal which which backends the object store that the data is on the object store and the, we can see the data on the demonstrator portal and that that would be next year's <laughs> thank you thank you Amelia and Matt for the presentation and for keeping it for 10 minutes <laughs> is there any questions yeah Thanks. Um, just an explanation for me. So does the object store sit alongside an archive of NetCDF files, or is it intended to be a replacement? Ultimately, uh, is, is it microphone? Yes, it is. Um, I think ultimately it's a replacement. Um, at the moment, both exist. Um, um, but. So at the moment, we do have NetCDF still sitting on traditional disks off to the side. Uh, and then we do all our conversion and then push it up to the object store, which is then for, um, so at the moment, for uh, it's only used by um, for specific use cases and, uh, and, and more specific things. But eventually, the idea is that one will replace the other and that you'll be able to, that will be the repository of the data in a sense. So you can be, access it from um, wherever you need to and do your more analysis in the cloud without ever having to download a copy of the data locally. That, that's kind of where it's heading, but it's not quite there yet. So how do you get the data in in the first place? Um, at the moment, I'm, so part of the, um, where did I have it? Um, the, yeah, part of this is that there's several ways of doing it. Um, the idea again is, is um, with with the sort of Pangea Forge thing that I've been looking at is that it will write it can read and write directly to the object storage. So it's almost as if it's once you've put your sort of configuration into into a, a file off the side, um, then it more more or less treats it as if you're reading and writing from disk. And so the idea is that it then is um, transparent to the user and it's not so important where you're actually reading or writing from. Um, at the moment. Um, that's still a bit work in progress and doesn't work as seamlessly as, as, as I would like. Um, so we use command line tools basically. Um, so I think, yeah, it's 
S3 storage, so S3 command or S4 command, or these command line tools. Um, that essentially is it's it's a it's a S4 command push these files to our object storage, and that's how they 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 go up there. Um, and you um, and sort of manage the the access of that from the uh, adjustment portal at the moment. That actually answer your question. I just rambled a bit, I think. But... Yeah, I mean, I can see that it would be really powerful, especially if you're building online services on top of the data that's in the archive and it's optimized in this way by putting it in object stores. It's great. I just wondered about the practicalities of how that works. Yes. So that's what we're trying to make easier, basically, and 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 write guides for. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a number of vendors nowadays that make uh, storage systems that present an object store interface and deposit interface to the same data on disk. So it might not be in my language. Yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question, Bob. That's okay. Um, just to comment on the dual access, we are going to have a look at doing that with our Corebyte. Um, so this question kind of relates to that. Um, your results for the time of the experience was really interesting. Was that um, individual ZAR objects? Um, yeah, possibly. Yeah. So, um, so the experiment basically was what we were doing there. So it doesn't, for us, it doesn't, depending on the chunk size, sometimes the, uh, the notebook would pick up more than one object within the data set because that is the type of the use case. So um, suppose if we are looking at one grid point for the whole time series, it will pick up the one object only when it is the 10 by 10 kilometer, the whole time period. It will only pick up that one project object. But if we are doing the same experiment with a different type of chunk, suppose the spatial data set, uh, the spatial chunk with just one month of data, what it'll do is it will pick up each object within that chunk and then extract the one grid point from it and then just read the next chunk, extract that one point for 30 days, then read the next monthly chunk, extract the one point, read it for 30 days. And that's why it becomes very slow, so depending yeah. on the use case. So each of those um, ZAR chunks is an individual object. That's, that's yes. how I see it. Yes, that's yeah. how I see it, but I'm so not 100% sure. It would be really interesting to compare um, uh, for instance, you mentioned Kachunk. Have you looked at Kachunk for having a single NetCDF file and using the NetCDF chunking with range gets? We have uh, definitely ex discussed it, yes. but we haven't been able haven't to explore it. Anger yet. Yes. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah. especially with dual access. Yeah. 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 It's a, it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Something to explore. Mm -hmm. Is it time for more questions? Uh, yeah. Just a question about what the sort of libraries or code you used to actually do the plotting once you had it in the ZAR format. What you know, are you using X array or something else? I'm just sort of thinking in terms of do we need to think about rewriting our codes completely if we yeah. have this type of thing, or is it a minor change if you talk about intake and other approaches? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. We do use the intake library to read in the data, and then yeah, basically it's X-ray plotting. The idea is yeah, yeah. once once intake or or matplotlib plotting FS, depending on your requirement. Once intake or FSMEC yeah. is used to read in the data, it, yeah, you it's a it's a line or two of code at the top ultimately, and then it gets out of the way. But it sounds like. I was probably really needs to revisit uh, intake, perhaps in that case, perhaps yeah. or something from a mail perspective. It's yeah. not. It's not the only way of doing it. Yeah, but but perhaps there yeah. are other tools. Uh, still, yeah, with, with, FFS. Yeah, yeah. the FS spec is quite useful yeah. as well. We, again, that's something we're still sort of trying to work out what the nicest way of doing it is that requires the least amount of code changes. So we've got against S three FS unless you really have to. <laughs> yeah. It did it's seem pretty slow. It's an S3 bucket to simulate a file system, but it has not all of the things that you would necessarily expect to deposit a compliant file system to have, like locking, for instance. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm British. I'm British. <laughs> Hi, so uh, I was wondering how much uh, customer we custom, uh, like how custom the receipts uh, that you are uh, creating with the uh, Angel Forge are, uh, so how custom they can be, and uh, if it is really worth uh, like moving from that to that type of approach in comparison to getting. Say a Python script that uh, yeah uh, calls extra line with chunker and that uh, can in the end uh, send back to the object store and in the middle you can do whatever steps you want. You know. Yeah, um, the recipes are completely customizable. That is that is that is the point of them. The idea is you write your own recipe, but they have they build the tools, the building blocks for your recipe. So mm -hmm. you, the building blocks will be like. Um, read in my files using XArray, combine them over this dimension, um, rechunk them to this size, and then put them onto the object storage somewhere. And they provide the syntax and the um, and all the sort of backend complexity that that entails. You don't have to worry about. You sort of put yeah. this, these are my steps, and off you go and do it. And yeah, it's customizable for whatever data set you're using. Yes, yeah, so is the idea. Can you basically use any library there, or is it? Uh... Is trained to those as a uh, um, company. It would be, in theory, um, we haven't tried it, but in theory, you can um, write in any pre or post processing steps yourself using the libraries that you you mm -hmm. use already. Um, I think that's a little more complicated, and we haven't done a huge amount of testing on that. I just know it's aware aware of it as a feature. Okay, um, but I think it is possible. Uh, final question. So, is the transfer to the object store done in parallel or is it in two? So, S4 command, I think, does it in parallel and it's pretty quick now. At least, okay. at least from. Can you set the number of calls that you need? Yes. To yes. It's again, that, that's, <laughs> like, that's one of the things we do play around with. But yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.